Okay, so it might be a little bit shorter tonight, so we'll take a look at this and stay warm as we can. Hopefully everybody's going to be okay tonight. <laughs> Such an awesome season to see uh, all the different things we can do in gathering together in just different tones and searching things out and who knows what God can actually do throughout all of this. This message I called tonight is called Mental Poison. Either it's fast, known, and painful, or it's slow, unknown, and painless. Mental poison. This is a certain place that people can hurt you, but this is a mental one. So we're going to look at something on a mind level and also something of a poison level to find out how things can look right when they're really not. So we want to break things down, especially this doctrine of grace because it's a very popular doctrine among God's people that are very sincere about their belief. But we have to remember that everything that is, is not just one ingredient. There's a lot of different ingredients to every thing there is. Many different things that goes into one topic or one doctrine. And so we want to try to see if we can look at the word grace today and to see what um, we can do. This is only like about a third of the things that I really was kind of downloading this week throughout the week this um, driving out this morning that's how it was certain during the great one of those 2012 13 revivals when things were really 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 hot and then we ran into some choppy weather and kind of learned some new tricks then back in the day some of you would probably remember and uh, really awesome though we, the Lord was moving there we sang the old songs together and we'd sing it is well with my soul and if someone tried to tell me there wasn't angels standing in the room you'd, you would never convince me of it I knew that the host of heaven was standing with us and we've had significant moments of the Lord and I know that God is going to take us through this new season of readjusting some very foundational things all the things we've been learning over the time it's been really really um, really clear as the Lord really speaks you just can't fail amen he's just so good at keeping us on target you know and when he leads where's where's nothing it's all it's all victory he leads us to victory even if it doesn't look like it in the natural we know that he is he is our safeguard he, we know that he is the true anchor of our souls and we never he never fails us and so because there's a lot of people who are so used to certain mindsets that don't make any sense at all i want to challenge everybody to remember we all have room to grow like Wigglesworth says, oh, the glory of God, there's nowhere to go but up because there's just nowhere to go. But there's just so much uh, vastness in, in all that he, he is altogether, altogether lovely and altogether impossible to search out his glories. They do, you can't find them because there's just too much. But we need to learn to see it and tap into this understanding because we were made to reflect upon this God. Amen. So it's a mental poison, poison to the mind. Either it's a fast known and painful poison death or it's slow and unknown and painless so satan can either get you quickly or he can take you down really really slow and so i'll get into the main thought in just a moment here and uh, of course you're going to know a lot of the things if, as i'm touching these things you'll the, the scriptures that would probably relate would probably bounce through your minds you probably go, yeah i can see what you're, i know what scripture that would relate to so i'm not going to read the text a lot i had some other texts i wanted to read but i didn't put them on the page one that really stuck out to me a lot was in Habakkuk, I think it's 2.14, where it's talking about the knowledge of God is going to be spread across the world as the water covers the sea. And there's going to be times when his knowledge is very, very clear, even to everything alive. It's going to be more clear at certain times when the Lord really moves. There's a lot of different reasons why he moves in certain places and certain times he doesn't move and he waits. There's a lot of different principles and uh, laws and dynamics as to why the Lord does certain things. And um, one of those little extra factors I want to look at today is because I, I want to give credit to where credit is due because people often will look at one definition of the word grace and say I know what grace is it's the un, un it's, it's the unmerited love and favor of God or something like something like this and every time they see grace in the Bible no matter the context no matter the crystal clear context all they'll ever see is oh unfairted love and merit of God, unmerited love and favor of God. That's all they see it as. They never see it as the power to overcome sin or the power to know the truth. Now I'm delivered from sin. No, it's, it's, always, it's always an excuse to love Jesus while you're in the flesh. 
which is which is a complete divorcement from what the apostles and Christ himself did teach. It's a mental poison. It's either fast and painful or it's either slow and painless. But either way, it still gets you the same way. It's still it's still death. And uh, a lot of times people will wonder, like, if I ever start talking about conclusions that I've come to, because I like to... You know, like as some of us would go through the scriptures a lot, and at one point in your life you go through a season of it, and you get a lot of understanding, and you get some more of the overall understandings. So I call it the overall. You know, I'm wearing my overalls today, so that's where I got my that idea from, because I didn't read just a verse. I read the Bible, and there's a lot of things that pop up, and you'll find there's a lot of different doctrines and what have you that are kind of like hidden. They're scattered through different doctrines. You won't find them all like lined up in one verse all the time. They're just scattered through the entire Bible, and you can dig them up, find out. Mercy of God scattered through, judgment of God scattered through. His your time's up. Your judgment is over. You, you don't have no time to, for repentance anymore. You'll see that scattered through the Bible. A lot of different things. It's kind of how we like to talk in here. Is just like natural. God downloads all kinds of things to me, and they don't even seem to line up. But I, I just show them to you the best we can and get through them. And that's kind of how child children talk, and that's how humans understand and learn. So it's 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 good the way it comes out. So. One more little thought before we go into the main kind of like main program today is to kind of challenge a, a, a fleshly place of the mind that happens along to Christians all the time. It's like when everything's going good, they don't want to be warned about things that is bad, that they're, they're walking on a path that you know is wrong. You know they're going to smack against the wall. And if you warn them, they'll be mad. And if they hit the wall and you didn't warn them, and then they'll be mad. Either way, why didn't you warn me? Or why did you? Why did you warn me? That's that's me. That's doom and gloom. Or why did you? Why didn't you warn me? Didn't you see me? Uh, you, I could have told you, but I didn't think you'd listen. Why? Well, you should have told me anyway. No matter what you do, it's always going to be wrong. But when we stand to the truth, we can't care about that. We can't care how they're going to react sometimes. Sometimes we have to be able to wound people to save their life. Uh, the kisses, the Bible says that the kisses of an enemy is better. No, the kisses of a... Uh, uh, the the kisses of an enemy is not good compared to the 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 wounds of a friend. The wounds of a friend is good compared to the kisses of the enemy. C people who are your enemy, they don't care about your soul. They don't care about how you uh, land at the throne of God, how you fare well at the throne of God. They don't speak to you in a way that's preparing you for the throne. They just want to make you feel comfortable and, and everything like now. But that's not how Christians are. The one who loves you the most is the one who tells you the most kingdom truth that will ultimately prepare you for the day you stand before the throne of God, which we all shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So those are some of the intros of kind of getting warmed up today. And um, I wanted to talk again. Like I said, it's it's um, there is a place in Scripture where you see people getting unmerited favor. It's not a false doctrine. It's just not the only doctrine. And if it's the, if grace is only the unmerited favor of God, that's a false doctrine. It's only a piece of it. It's only one little ingredient to the entire doctrine of grace. So don't say that is all of grace. That is only a piece of grace. And I'm going to prove it tonight. Unexpected mercies. Amen. Unexpected mercies. Yes, you get to go through unmerited favor sometimes. Not always. It's not a wherewithal. Amen. It's it's sometimes. Not always. If it happens, wonderful. It's a good bonus. But it's not always like that, I said. Because there's certain X factors. They just line up and all of a sudden, whoa, it's just like this. Well, we'll look at some examples in just a minute. But let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and ask the my, my Most High to be with us and to make the word come spiritually clear to the hearing of our of our hearts. Heavenly Father, we love you and we want this word to be in your hands, God. We want our hearts, Lord, to be in your hands and we want to be delivered from what we believe to what you believe we should believe. We want to see the way you see, Lord. We don't want to see uh, the way we're living, God, in the eyes of the flesh. We don't want to see it with what we've necessarily been taught, God, but we want to, we want what we've been taught mixed with your, with faith, Lord. Things that we've understood in the Bible, but mixed with living faith, where you are currently leading us in a way that we hadn't even thought about before, because when you move, you move suddenly, Heavenly Father. You move in a way that causes us to remember how lively we can feel, and, and, and that spring in our step again of, the, of faith that you cause us to, to, to rise up and conquer, Lord, and, and take down many dragons, and to rise up and, and, and shine so much light, and, and direct so many souls to your kingdom, Lord. I, I pray Lord, that we would remember the lively place, Lord, remember the path of life, and to, to easily uh, 
remove the seducer voice. Help us to be able to overstep and say, no, that is not true. And no, because of the relationship that we have with you that is so closely intimate that the, the, the almost doesn't even sound good anymore. Pray that the dividing line would be utterly clear tonight as your Holy Spirit comes and that razor's edge of the edge of the sword, Lord, would truly divide, Lord, and set us free in every way uh, down to the smallest part of our heart, Lord, and understanding. Help us to see... Heavenly Father, the way you want us to see that our freedom could be true and real. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, indeed. So unexpected mercies. Yes, you get to go through unmerited favor sometimes. Amen. But not always. And so it reminds me of a story that I, when I was living at about 18 years old, when I got out of high school, I was living in, uh, my parents was in Hawaii at the time. And we were hanging out with my dad's friend and he, uh, he rides his motorcycle every morning to work, and uh, it's really early in the morning, so there's nobody on the freeway at all. But he says, like, one time, I mean, actually, every morning, he, it's the same time he gets out there. He's, like, the same time, and his buddy catches up with him on the freeway, and they all race. They, they, two of them race down the freeway in the middle of the night, and it's they go about 100 or more on the freeway. And then they get to the end of the, the exit, and they cruise off and say, all right, we're right on. And one time was really hilarious because he's cruising down there. He sees the he sees a bike over there, and he's like all ready to roll. And they kind of give each other the nod. They roll, and he didn't even realize who it was. He thought it was his friend. And later on, he gets to the he gets to the exit after going 100 miles an hour, going as fast as they can. And and he gets to the thing, and he sees it's a bike cop. And the bike cop gives him a thumbs up, and he cruises off. And I was like, what? And he's just guy's like, man, could you can you believe that? It's like he just thought I was just being cool and having the fun, and just happened to catch that guy on a good time. Try that every day, and see it. Try to try to race with the bike cop every day. Sometimes you might it might be a merciful moment, but not always. You can't always get away with that kind of stuff all the time. It doesn't work that way. There's a gospel track from Jack Chick. It's a time where this kid was playing baseball and he knocked the ball right through a car window and it happened to be the car window of a judge. And the judge was like, whoa, you busted my window. And so he's like, you know what? I know you didn't mean to. I'm just going to let you go. And so he lets the kid go and the kid's like, man, I'm in good with the judge, man. I'm, 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 I'm in top notch form now, man. I can do anything. I can get away with anything. And so he one day gets really, really angry and does something really bad. I don't even want to say, but he, when he got older, he still thought he was good with the judge and because he was friends with the judge now and he ended up ending somebody's life and and stands before the judge and the judge says yes i'm your friend but i'm also your i'm also the judge and i have to judge the crime that you've done and i judge you guilty and you're going to jail for life and he's totally mesmerized what i thought that you were my friend you were going to get me off again it's like no i, I that happens sometimes but not all the time you don't just live like that i had a, a roommate one time that says you know the the apartments you know they don't they, they can fix these machines for free so it's okay if you stuff your machine full of a bunch of clothes it might damage your stuff but it's not going to matter because they can fix it for free and i was like what kind of attitude Attitude is that man you don't you don't want to just be careless and throw things on the ground in the bathroom because the custodian will come in there no it some things happen and you want to be there for that but not always amen you, you don't want to you don't want to expect these mercies all the time Israel got to go into the promised land from a covenant between God and David and not for their own righteousness of their of their own self that was very stressed by Moses when he gave the big speech before they went in to the promised land he says you're going into the thing but it's not because you guys did good because you guys didn't do well it just happens to be right now God's going to overlook this and you're going to move in you're going to get unmerited favor right now if they try to live on unmitted or fader all the time, look what happened to them. They, they probably tried to do that, and they ended up in sin, and they ended up under judgment most of the time. But just because they had one easy time, they lived falsely, and they still went in because of something God had with David prayer. And then they got to go in. It was a, it was a mercy that got them through. It was an unexpected mercy. We can go through that sometimes, but not all the time. Amen. There is an extreme, there, no, there's an element to the grace of God this this way, but not completely. It's only one piece of the grace of God. You cannot have salvation without God. Amen. Salvation is with God. It's God's grace. It's His way that we're supposed to be looking at. God alone is Elohim. It's just that's who He is in and of Himself without anybody ever created. He's always been there. Elohim God all by Himself. And versus who we, who is, when Jesus comes or whenever He has covenant with uh, Adam or Abraham or Moses or anybody, it's Emmanuel, God with us. There's a covenant between heaven and earth. This is where there's connection and 
things change at this point. The situation is completely different now because now it's not just him, it's him with us, and now we have to be able to relate to him. And how do we do that? But by his word. He gives us a word in each covenant and says, you walk here and you'll have covenant relationship here. There's sin, so we have to put death. Now in the New Testament, we have the sin issue, but we put the Lamb of God on there, and that's taken care of. Walk here, take this upon yourself, and wait for the spiritual thing to convert. And now we have Emmanuel, God with us. Salvation is now connected to, together. The situation is different because now he's not alone. He's now with us. It's a completely different picture all together. There must have been an agreement. Okay, There must be an agreement there for this thing to, to be a legitimate overall. But we, we don't want to take advantage, like I said. Like the world system right now, like we've been talking about how crazy things are getting and everything's getting very robotic and things moving into the frequency level and all this stuff. The world wants to replace the Holy Spirit with, with the internet. And it's getting so strong, they're going to try to connect the whole world, literally, turning us into, like I call the antennas, in a sense, to make us be susceptible to be connected to this world wide web. And it's going to ultimately get so, so much that we can't even think our own thoughts. They're going to get so involved and get us to where we, we're, we're just going to get sucked right into the thing. If you continue to fall in love with the world, we're going to go this direction. Like I said, get ready to hit the brakes and lose everything to hold on to true faith because that's how it's going to have to be an abrupt halt of losing everything and I really mean everything in order to avoid going so far where you really don't have any power over it and you were going to take the mark because you're just completely zapped into it but they're trying to replace the Holy Spirit this whole frequency thing with the with the world wide web and everything this is like the Antichrist Holy Spirit and they're trying to replace that so we can have a, a unity between this computer and people and they unify there that's the covenant between these two in the world system and eventually are going to put it into you so you are a part of the system. You're just another connection to the computer, something that doesn't match. Computer and people, well, they can make it so they do match. Well, God is holy and people are sinful. How can you connect them? Well, there's a covenant here and there's a covenant here. We want to make sure we don't fall into this one, of course. To take a piece of the grace of God and make it into that is the completion, and that is absolutely not true. That's a ruin of the gospel that God, Christ did preach. Our entire physical bodies are, in fact, 90% water. Amen. But the amount of water it would take to run the machine of a human being is not all that we are. Amen. Just because you have that much water that would be here doesn't mean you have almost a human. No, there's a whole lot more complicated parts to it than that. Um, there's, there's only one ingredient of who we are is the water. We would be dead is if that's all we were. If all we were was just water, we would cease to exist. Amen. If that's all we were is just water. And here's another thought is that when it comes to the grace of God, if all your grace of God is only unmerited favor, your faith is dead. Your grace is dead as well. If all you have is just unmerited favor, your grace is dead. There's different definitions of grace. I'm going to show you only some of the definitions in the 1828 dictionary. It's the only dictionary I use because it's the, it's the best. I'll give you the second one first because this is the one that we always say. It does say the free unmerited love and favor of God. Favor of God. That's what it says. Free unmerited love and favor of God. That's actually a definition. The first one is we are to uh, the, the grace that we give to other people. Favor from us to other people is the grace that we give to other people, not what we give from get from God. The third one is the word grace, favorable influence of God, like divine influence, like supernatural influence from God, um, influence of the spirit, the renewing of the heart. Um, and restraining from sin. So there's a grace. The third definition of the def dictionary is a, is a favorable influence from God, divinely giving you the power to overcome sin. So as much as they like to favor number two, why don't you favor number three too? Because those are both biblical. They're both very scriptural. They're scripture to, to show you in the dictionary itself. The fourth definition of grace is the application of Christ's righteousness to the sinner. The application of his grace upon you. There's a grace that's like a type of atonement, of, uh, angle of grace as well. The fifth one is the state of reconciliation to God. We're in a state of grace. There's an act of grace. There's a state of grace as well. The sixth one, virtuous or religious affection or disposition. Kind of like your attitude, your faith, your meekness, your humility, your patience. Kind of like the fruit of it is a, is a type of a grace proceeding from divine influence. So the thing that happened to us is also a sense of the grace of God as well. Spiritual instruction is a, is a great improvement and edification God gives to us is also an element of the grace of God. That's only seven. There's still tons more. Apostleship over the qualifications of apostle. God gave you a grace to you, almost like a wiring or a gifting to make you a, 
to be able to operate in a way that you could never humanly possibly do. Um, like stuff that you've ever done in your anointing. You know, sometimes when you have it and you can fly and other times you can't, you can't even move your head off the pillow because you're so off. Like, uh, you know, how we've seen Elijah do that. He, he's fighting all the prophets of Baal, pulling fire down from heaven and all of a sudden the anointing's gone and one lady's ch chasing him and he's running for his life. You know, it's amazing when the anointing comes, you're bold. And then when he's not there, you're like, no, I'm going to die. Everything's crazy. No, this is not working. Oh my, everything I've ever done was wrong. Uh, the devil's lying to me. Uh, he's, uh, I'm a failure. You know, it's just amazing. The, the lack of the, the mind change is so different when you're in the flesh. Eternal life is a sense of grace. The salvation being final in your life. That's grace as well. Number nine, favor, mercy, and pardon is number 10. Favor conferred, whatever that means. I forgot what the definition there. Uh, privilege as a grace is also a privilege. And it goes on to, I think like, like twice as many as that as well. But we're not necessarily talking about the, the different graces altogether because there's a lot of things in salvation that isn't grace, but yet there's still several ingredients to salvation itself. But grace is the one I wanted to hit mostly today because that one is the one that is being perverse. They slowly change it over time to just this. They magnify this one, and the next generation thinks that's all it is. Oh, the grace, yeah, unmerited favor. Oh, I messed up again. No problem. Well, we need to have that original touch. All I'm, all my ministry is based upon three main things. It's just sin, salvation and regeneration. If this miracle really happens, you're never going to look at the grace of God falsely unless you just happen to buy the lie that someone gives you. But it's not what you have learned from God, and it's certainly not what you learn from the Word of God in regular, clear thinking. All pieces to the puzzle must be there, amen, for the grace to be real. There is too much to conclude on paper. That That is why we must live by relationship to God and His Holy Word. Altogether, we will know where to step and where not to, amen. So, there's a lot of things you can just dial in and conclude and line upon line, precept upon precept. And when we go there, we're not going to overcome because we were not made to live like this graph paper. You can do that to learn it, but you don't live like that. That's just how you do it to figure it out. And once you got it, you just live like that. And you just live like, like that and God will start to relate to you. That's how you can connect to something that's impossible. Having our spirit awaken to the righteousness of God and conclude this genuine, divine, intimate relationship with the spirit of God, pointing to Christ, pointing to our sins. We always know, oh, God, I'm sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Not felt wrong. Lord, okay, I better go apologize. I back bit again. I better go fix that. And you want to, you're sensitive to things because now you know the intimacy with the Holy Spirit is actually real. All pieces of the puzzle must be there. There's way too much to even put together on paper. It's just, it's, it gets to be so much that it's not even worth it. That's why he just says, just take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean? Have the attitude of Lord, your way is above my way in every way. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to fear you. I'm going to fear losing touch with your spirit that I don't want to lose touch of your voice. I don't want to live in a desert in my soul where I don't even sense you like I knew how I did when I could lift my hands and glorify your name and the joy unspeakable and full of glory, tears streaming down my face, all this reality of the presence of Christ and one little mistake. And, oh, Lord, I grieved your spirit. We want to get to that place where the little things make you so, oh, that's not okay. That's not okay. And you have that atmosphere about you where you don't even have to say it. And you, people know that's not okay. Just being around you, they know it's not okay because you walk in the presence of God. Happened when Yang Cho gets into the uh, car and John Bevere is driving and he, says, he was told, don't talk to him because he's concentrating on his sermon. He's, he's meditating. He prays four or five hours a day and he's so powerful in the Holy Spirit. He gets in the car. He felt like heaven just got in the car and he's trying to drive and he's just weeping so profusely. He's like, my goodness. He says, I'm not supposed to talk, but Pastor Yangi, Joe, God is in this car. And he yes, 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 yes. And he's just weeping. Why? Because he got in there. He just hangs out with God so much that just being around him, you just know things. How did that happen? Because you spent so much time intimacy with the Holy Spirit, intimacy with the Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father. So much is trying to cloud my mind. God Almighty, shake it off. Shake it off like that snake on, on the on Malta Island that Apostle Paul did. The grace of God was never meant to be a license to sin, but sometimes it looks like that in a certain point in history at times, but not always. Amen. It looks like that sometimes. There are certain things that attract spirits. When the focus on spirits is real and right, then they will manifest. I remember that long time ago when the house church first began and everybody started telling their demon stories. And I said, okay, we got to stop now because you keep talking about it, they're going to manifest. And I don't want them to manifest. We want to talk about the glories of God. We want to declare his greatness in this house, that his spirit will start to take form in this house. You know, we got to watch out. We want to declare and decree who, who this world truly belongs to. Speak a certain language. 
certain spirits will follow. Certain things were made to thought patterns, they attract the wrong spirit. Certain carvings, they're made to attract the wrong spirit. Certain TV shows, movies, visuals, things like this. And there's ways of getting that same thing that happens to you. If I speak to you in plain English and you get the message in your conscious mind that you can see versus the one that you can't see in your subconscious mind, both of your minds are getting it. One you're clear on and one that you didn't know. Well, there's other ways that they send messages to through these devices, whether it's carvings, TV shows, movies, philosophies, just the influence of people with their bad behavior and a lack of fear of the Lord or lack of understanding or spiritual blindness, they're still sending a message and it's reaching your subconscious mind and you don't even know that it's killing you. It's mental poison that it's getting you the same result and you don't even know it. There's certain kind of things that attract evil spirits. It's good or bad, depending on what you think, say, influenced by, get around, whatever you want to do. It attracts either the spirit of God or it's t touching the spirit of the devil. And there's no gray area. It's either God or it's the devil. So we've got to be very sensitive because you don't even know it's happening. That's why we don't walk by our own understanding because our own understanding is only failing. It's only this temporal mode. There's some things we can know instantly. There's some things we know for the season. And there's some things we know as a lifetime. And I'm telling you, the subconscious mind is your lifetime place of understanding. Your understanding is being changed. You watch a Disney movie, they put the, the hidden in there, sex. In a lot of different movies, it says sex in there. Little kids are watching it, sex. It's part of my lifestyle now. That's why they don't ever come like they used to do every course, because they're talking to them directly, and they don't even know it. They're getting the message there anyway. When the focus on spirits is real, then they will manifest careful with entertainment world it was made to open these portals to the spirit realm cigarettes alcohol music movies and etc they were made to do this thing they were made to invoke spirits things must be in order in our lives or it could very well be like the, these philosophies the bible says that philosophy will destroy your faith amen certain things are landing pads for spirits judge yourself is of god don't judge yourself that is of satan that's how you can manifest spirits. So whenever you go to a charismatic church and they tell you, don't judge yourself. God forgives you just like you are. That is a lie. God says to judge yourself. That's holy. Don't judge yourself. That spirit that you found is not of God. That's a philosophy and you got it directly and you're being mentally poisoned instantly and, you, and you're being clearly poisoned quickly or it's a slow death because it went to your subconscious. They tricked you. They got you to receive some spirit that you didn't even really realize. Like, that didn't quite sound right. That was the unction of the Holy Ghost trying to train itself in you to say, child, you might not understand it here, but I, you know it somewhere else. Over here where I'm operating, I want you to know, stop. I'm warning you deeply. That's how we're supposed to be sensitive. We're not trying to walk by the flesh. We're walking by the Spirit. And the unction of the Holy Spirit, when he says, no, child, don't try to make sense of it because you don't operate here. We operate here. I'm trying to talk to you where the real war is happening, where you can't physically see it and you can't even put it together in your mind. You're not supposed to because it's much deeper than that. Say it the Lord. World mindsets invite devil to, sub, to sub, subtly take control of our paths. It's getting dark now. Oh, sorry. I'm going to hang in there for just a little bit. Got to get some light here. Like a microscope, a scientist can see the natural eye, what the natural eye cannot see. Or the equipment for a radio wave expert likely would be able to see the sound waves and see how they move outside the normal field of vision or the natural eye. When you're doing music and stuff like that, you can see the patterns of the sound waves on your thing. You can see when they go up and down and up and down um, on the sound wave. It's just like that. You can't see it as it's happening, but you can catch it and observe it on a computer. But we can't see how it's actually operating. There's ways of getting that same message through without you even knowing it. That's what frequencies are all about. They're giving you a message and you don't even know what's happening. That's why it's going to get so dangerous if we don't watch and be very careful. If we're very just, hey, well, I didn't notice it in anything. Well, because you're not looking at what the spirit of God is. Spirit, the deepest place of you, God is trying to say, child, be alert, to be sober. The devil is not playing on the game that you think. He's not playing on the field that you're playing on. You're playing. He's playing on a different field, so you got to be more sober than you might have thought you needed to be. And he'll He'll let you know exactly what that is when you break through in the prayer closet. Same as the prophet can see things that the natural eye cannot see. It happens in the spirit, it happens in the radio waves, and it happens in the microscopic uh, germs and what have you, uh, mic um, cells and what have you. 
Do you see how a person speaks a message and the message is going to the frontal lobe where conscious thoughts are made and held to a short-term parking, kind of like short-term situation there? When you go to the when you go to the when they go to the airport, there's three different levels of it. You got the you drive up there and grab them and go because in, in, within a one minute or two, and then you go to the short-term parking and you're there for maybe an hour, or long-term parking and you're there for a long time. It's exactly the same thing. How the mind works. It's either instantaneous right now in the moment, or it's for the day or the season, or it's long-term. It's a life. It's more of a long-term seasonal thing in your life, maybe even lifetime. It's the same same way how it operates in our in our in our understandings. The same imprint happens in your subconscious mind when you're hearing it directly or it's happening in a way that you don't even know it's happening and it is possible to do this with frequencies and make the same impression into the here subconscious mind without speaking that the ear can even be notified the message seems to be able to bypass the normal ear canal and head straight to where the final understandings are made it's a pretty powerful thought ain't it pretty powerful thought and here's another thing you think about like how we're talking about the certain things that attract spirits words but, but he, he, actions speak louder than words amen there's the, verbal is the lowest form of communication mood swings the way you shift your body the facial expressions that you don't even mean to be making you don't even you think you're smiling but on the outside you look crazy because your face is clearly not okay amen but actions speak louder than words so if you act like a demon you're still inviting demonic activity to hang out with you and thus bind you spiritually which at times in your life you will be that you will be clear that, that something is definitely wrong okay yeah, so once in a while, you start acting funny, you start living a different way. Well, that doesn't really matter. It doesn't look matter to your frontal lobe. It doesn't matter to certain obvious places, but in the spirit, something, eventually you start to realize something isn't right anymore. I was carrying on, and now some just doesn't sit, oh God, I just, <laughs> I remember I played that song before, and the heaven came down in my car. Tears came down, my eyes came down, my hands went up, and I didn't even care. And now I fear, man, the song didn't touch me. God, something doesn't seem the same. What's going on here? I'm not, I'm not what I once was. Something's changing. God, what happened to me? Is he talking to me on a way I don't even know he's talking? Did I open up a door? Like if someone wanted to poison your body to kill you, they could do it one of two ways. Right? They can do it really clearly or hidden from your sight or knowing. One guy gets it quick. It's clear in an underground massive cave with hundreds of face-painted warriors for some tribe. And the leader says, tie him up and bring in the poison. We'll dump it down his throat until he dies. So this is clear, it's quick, and it's painful. The other is slow, painless, and done without anyone knowing it. But they both get killed either way. There's different ways of doing it to the physical, and there's different ways to do it in the natural. Mental poison, either it's fast, known, and painful, or it's slow, unknown, and it is painless. Very, 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 very important to, to keep that on overall. Knowing that heaven is not guaranteed is the beginning of wisdom. If I have to interpret it for the modern uh, heretics today that say that we believe in the fear of God. You don't believe in the fear of God the way you're supposed to believe in the fear of God. The way you can fear God is to know that heaven is not a guarantee for you. Everyone who is under the blood atonement of Christ, you can know for sure that it's not a guarantee for you. Every covenant people fell out of. What covenant? Why is this one different? Because it's the blood of Jesus. It's still a covenant of the word of God, no matter whether it was the blood of Jesus or, or the blood of the animals that they used in the Old Testament. Either way, it was still by the word of God, and it was provisions only in this place alone. That was where his word was. So no, it wasn't guaranteed for Israel, and it certainly isn't guaranteed for his New Testament. Romans 11 says if he could throw out his first people, which most he did, he could easier throw out his new. So how you can get to this point where I don't have to worry about it? No, know that heaven is not a guarantee, that you must abide and hold true biblical spiritual confidence until the end. That's what the Bible says you must do. In the, that's the beginning of wisdom. You really don't have a, a premise for understanding the realities of God until you understand that it isn't guaranteed. If you think it's guaranteed, we won't get agree because so much of the things I experience in the Lord is in the fear of God. Isn't it amazing? Holiness and the fear of God. When the angels are speaking, those are the ones who are at close proximity to God. And when you see the angel of Revelation 14, what does he preach? The gospel of the everlasting gospel. Fear God and give glory to him. Why does the angel say to fear God? Why doesn't people? Because you don't see God the way they do. Why does the angels before the throne of God scream, holy, holy, holy? Why? Because fear and holy is who he really is. And if you're not speaking this language, all you're speaking is a mental poison version of the grace of God. Unmerited love and favor of God. 
that's only a part of it sometimes but not always knowing that heaven is not a guarantee is a beginning of wisdom what fear of God is there without the fear that one day it might not be well with your soul he might take away my blessings or reward what a bunch of garbage that's not the fear of God that's a fear of losing your rewards that's not the same as losing your soul Jesus himself feared drinking that cup because he knew what was in the cup what was in the cup the wine press of the wrath and the hatred of God it pleased the Lord to bruise his own son I prophet Isaiah said if we knew what was in the cup we would fear so much it might make us look unloving at times to those who are clearly blind and dead they're dead and they're wrong and they're dead wrong of course you're going to offend them because they're of the world. They're of their father, the devil, and they hate you from the beginning. They hated Jesus, and they're going to hate those who really understand who Christ truly is. It's not a, a, a place where you just let yourself go. It's a place you judge yourself, and you concentrate carefully until he spiritually lets you know. If you can just prance on into the gospel, you haven't found the gospel of the Bible. You seek out, search out the hidden places of God to find out who he truly is. Amen. When we lose our train of thought of salvation, salvation being a miracle, and true growth and maintaining of the true miracle, then we run into extracurricular activities. Satan wants to poison us in another way as well. Same way the world system does in the, in the school system. You know what they do? They try to tell you. Have you ever heard of TAG? It's called Talented and Gifted that they do give to kids. People who are a little overly gifted, they would put them in TAG because they figured these are the people who are really overly gifted and they're going to figure out the scams and the schemes of the public school system and so they get you they get the talented kids to get involved with focusing on their own brilliance instead of focusing on the the truth of god or, you know or you know the truth that there's of the scams of this public school system in the same way satan's got all kinds of interesting things to get people to focus on when they're overly gifted a lot of overly gifted people they make nuisances of themselves because they they don't remember that salvation was a miracle and true growth and maintaining this growing miracle it's a growing miracle is what salvation ought to be growing fruitful life amen they get you focusing on four different things and things that are true but not the main emphasis of revival and prayer Yes, they're true, but they're not profitable, brother. Or they're, they're, they're extra into things that are not even totally true. Or they're into things that are hardly true at all because they're, they're twisting the truths. Or they're into things that aren't even true at all. You get so in involved with stuff like that. People, oh, did you hear what the black Hebrew Israelites were saying? They're saying some really important truths. No, they're not. There's nothing that comes from their mouth that is true. It's bad enough when your email doesn't go through, but even worse when your email doesn't go through. We lose our real prayer life and the intimacy there when you guard it with such, with such emphasis because it is real. Don't say that stuff around me. That grieves the spirit, brother. I won't fellowship with you if you keep talking like that. We need Christians who talk like that. To say, I don't care if I wound you. I want to wound you to save your soul. Amen. To build the spiritual house, it's like building a real house. You have to build the scaffolding sometimes to get to those higher places to, to work harder, to work at higher places. Very, really important when we're building physical or spiritual houses. There's other things that go involved than just the house itself. There's a lot of wisdom. Little people want to jump ahead in their businesses. They want to jump ahead in relationships or they want any good thing in this world. They want to jump ahead even in salvation. And they don't build the scaffolding to do it properly. They run ahead of the Holy Spirit sometimes. The same way the body is made to reject bad stuff, it's like you cough things up because it doesn't. It's not supposed to be inside of you. Your body knows better. You, we just eat whatever tastes good, but then our body rejects a lot of things in different ways. Sometimes it comes out of your eyes or nose or mouth, whatever. It just your body does not accept it because your body is telling you this is not natural. And the same thing happens when we are when we're truly ceased from sin, put away the things of the flesh, and all of a sudden you start to know, you start to regurgitate. Oh, that doesn't work. You start to reject things. Your body, by your spirit, starts to reject things as well. Do we, do we react in awkward ways to things we embrace and wonder what's wrong? If we are trying to live the truth path but continue to embrace false as well, there will be a point where your life will try to reject in order to preserve one or the other. Either life is going to be trying to preserve one. You walk in the wrong, it's going to try to push away the truth. You walk in the truth, it's going to try to push away the lie. It's going to reject the bad. You walk in the good, it's going to continue to, to cleanse you and to show you over and over the true, the matter over overall. But truthfully, overall, we really don't want to walk in a mental poison. 
the fast one it's really easy to see like oh, I'm just gonna go well, live in drugs and blah 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 and just get into things that is absolutely crazy or we can do something that's very subtle where we don't even see it happening we, we've, we've learned not to care about the, 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 the things that God has shown us ponder that path whenever God truly showed you something build all your views from there you can never fail add it up from there and say well if that was wrong then this must be wrong you know sometimes you can say that God's like I don't have to tell you you should know by now when God doesn't speak it's because he knows you know better that's what he does he says hey, you can find it in your in the word or you can find it just common sense just just think a little bit longer I'm not going to reveal too much to you because the more I reveal to you the higher the standard for you will be and right now you're not showing much promise I don't want to rack the judgment up the higher we have the more judgment we're going to be standing to so we got to be sober about what God has shown us and, and to live according to what God has shown us to the, the stage that he actually has us at well that's a, pretty much the main the main word tonight there's a bunch more that we, we have to get into another time or I'll just do a separate video for it overall but let's go and pray that the Lord will help us to remain sensitive to his spirit. Amen. We want to be sensitive to his kingdom leading in our hearts. It's so key. Amen. So key to know where the where the Almighty really wants us to be that we can behold him in his splendor and glory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for helping make plain the significance of the battle that we are in. We know we're at war, and we know the enemy is trying to win our souls, Lord, and we, we don't want him to win, God. We don't want him to take ground in our life because he know, we know that as soon as he takes a little ground, he's going to take more, Lord. As soon as we start losing our prayer life in the morning or in the night, Lord, it's just gonna, it's, we're just going to keep missing, and we'll develop a habit of talking big and living small because we don't even know where the true life is anymore. We don't know where the way, the truth, and the life is anymore because we've lost that spiritual connection. Our knee mail isn't getting through anymore. We're, we're losing something, God, and we don't want to lose. We want to. We, we don't want to be careless and prayerless about the things of Your kingdom, Heavenly Father. We want to be sharp and sober and ready in season, in season and out of season, ready to convince and rebuke and exhort, Lord, at Your bidding. I pray that we would have the life of the kingdom spirit, Lord. We will judge ourselves, dear Heavenly Father, and make plain, Lord, the convictions and the testimonies and the statutes of Your will and Your word, dear Heavenly Father. Your words, the mouth from Your, uh, the words of Your mouth, dear Heavenly Father, that it will gently lead us onto the right path. Show us by your glory. Show us by relationship, Lord. We can't always remember everything in our frontal lobe, but we can know long-term in relationship in our subconscious mind, in the depths of our spirit, in the depths of our soul, to have it here, Lord, and, and saturated there, Heavenly Father. We can be marinated in the wonders and the splendors of God and the epic realities of testimonies of those who have touched the glory realm themselves. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that the work that you do will be a radical declaration of how great you are, how great our God is, how great thou art, dear Heavenly Father. They would turn many a souls, sending thousands to flight, dear Heavenly Father, of many souls turning back to the light when a little light turns on in this dark world. I pray, Lord, that your name would be praised, Lord. And when we leave, no one will remember us, but they will remember the one that died and raised again and paid the way to heaven. I pray that your name would get glory by the blood. Of, and, and thank you for the blood of Jesus, dear Heavenly Father. Hallelujah and amen. 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 It's getting dark, huh? Yeah, stand up. Go ahead. Oh, no.